graduation for the school of preaching will be June the whatever the third Sunday of June. The third Sunday. Yeah, about the seventeenth. I guess. Yeah, it sounds about right. This is probably going to make all kinds of noise here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Cedric just raised an antenna up there. <laughs> Okay, I can. Hello, June. Okay, all right, wonderful. Well, I am very glad that all of you are here tonight, and we have enough to have class, don't we? We have class, yes. We're thankful for the privilege of midweek study. We did have a good lectureship, though, I believe, and good to see a lot of dear friends we've known and loved through the years, and so uh, glad to hear some good preaching and have some good singing. It was all wonderful. I left on Thursday and uh, had the privilege of holding a gospel meeting at Southwest in Austin over the weekend, and so Friday, Saturday, and Sunday's meeting, and I got back in on Monday night. And so my meeting's over, and all these other folks are still out on the road traveling. So pray for them that they will be able to return to us very, very soon and have some good reports. I did not um, receive a report today from any of the campaigns. I contacted Brother Bland about an hour or so ago, and he did not know what was happening on the campaigns because he's not conducting one. He is actually in a gospel meeting in Tupelo, but no students are with him. But I do know Brother Clark is um, over in Middle Tennessee. Brother Moser's in South Georgia. I'm not sure about the other campaigns. But nevertheless, we are going to pray for them, and we're looking forward to them returning. And we want to continue to remember those who uh, are sick, and some among us are getting better. We're thankful for that. So let's go to God in prayer. Our Father, we're thankful unto Thee for the privilege of this day and for taking such good care of us to this point in time. We come before Thy throne this evening asking Thy blessings to be upon uh, our students and those who are preaching in these gospel meetings, that they will have success and that likewise they will return to us safely. We're praying for those who continue to be uh, sick because of various uh, afflictions, and for those who have recently had surgery, we're praying for their continued recovery. Bless us, Father, throughout this service tonight. Help us to grow in our understanding of thy word and in sweet fellowship with thee and with each other. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're presently studying in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and two weeks ago, uh, during our last class period, uh, we closed that class with verse 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, which is, a, which is a passage that is very familiar to those of us that are familiar with gospel preaching. Oftentimes we have heard this passage used as a warning, as a warning. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, two, two things would come to the mind of the ones who originally heard this in Corinth. This would be a place where justice is to be served. Is that part of what happens at judgment? Yes. It also, though, represents the Olympian who is on a platform receiving 
his crown, receiving his wreath of victory. And so when we consider Judgment Day, there is a positive and a negative connotation to that, right? It is a most positive day for those of us who are saved, for on that day we will receive the crown of life. It will be like standing uh, where the Olympian would, stood, would have stood and received his, his medal, his prize, his reward. On the other hand, it stands like a hall of justice, doesn't it? Where judgment shall be exacted from the throne of Christ himself. It is his judgment seat, understandably so, because... He is the one with all authority. God hath committed all judgment to the Son. And again, we emphasize the personal nature of judgment. No one will miss it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. It is personal in the sense that what? Everyone, everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Here the emphasis again on the life we have lived will be reviewed. Now, that particular passage is one that we never want to overlook. It is a certainty that the judgment day is going to come. And one thing we know, it's closer today than it was yesterday. And if there's a tomorrow, it'll be closer then than today, right? Now, knowing, therefore, Paul says, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, he is not talking about terror here in the sense of trembling with terror, don't connect that because of the previous verse as, as, as uh, that's what Paul's saying when he's not. Uh, because we have reverential devotion and awe for God, we persuade men. Because we love God, because we are seeking to live our lives in accordance with, with the Lord's will, we are bringing people to Him. Now remember, Paul's also defending his apostleship here, isn't he? So knowing God like we do, understanding who he is, loving him, adoring him, knowing therefore the fear of the Lord, standing in the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. We want you to know, Paul says, who we are. We're not like the false apostles that we've told you about. We're not like those who are guilty of hypocrisy we've told you about. Not at all. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. And he says, the way we live our lives is made known unto God, but I also trust, he says, is made known to your consciences. You see? He said, the way that I live my life is known by God. He knows that I'm genuine. He knows that I have your best interest at heart. He said, I'm not worried about what God thinks of me. He said, I know what God thinks about me. He says, I do want you to also think the same way about me. That is, that I'm genuine, that I have your best interest at heart, just like the Lord knows my heart. Okay? So, we commend not ourselves again to you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. Now, that's the context, isn't it? Are there those that glory in appearance? Yes. Are there those that are hypocritical? Yes. Were they some who were charging Paul falsely? Yes, they were. He says, you see, they glory in appearance and not in the heart. Now, is that something our Lord Jesus Christ dealt with in his personal ministry? Sure he did. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 5 and right to the, to the Sermon on the Mount as we think about that just for a moment. Look at Matthew 5, 20. Remember this incredible statement made by Jesus when he says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Can you imagine what Pharisees thought about that when they heard Jesus say that? Because they were the religious leaders. They were the ones who set the standard in their minds. But what was the problem? They didn't worship God from the heart. They really weren't in love with God. And so, so Jesus is saying, your, your religion is going to have to exceed theirs because he said it's not real. And that's what he means. Unless it exceeds their, their religion, then he says uh, you'll, you'll not enter into the kingdom of heaven. That should not 
frighten any of us. What Jesus is saying, love me and do what I ask you to do because you love me. He says, they don't, they don't uh, love me. And then in chapter 6, verse 1, here's their problem, okay? Matthew 6, 1. Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. And that's the same thing Paul's talking about over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, We commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that ye may have somewhat to answer them which glory in appearance and not in heart. He said, If you glory in us at all, he said, I want you to glory in the fact that we love God and that we are seeking to do His will. And then he says in verse 13, For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your cause. That word beside there means insane. <laughs> okay? You know anybody like that? We've known a few people we thought were that way down through the years, right? He said, If we appear like we're insane to you, well, just let it be said that we're, we're, in, we're insane on behalf of God. In other words, we're zealous on God's behalf. Now, what would these enemies of Paul be saying? He's insane. I mean, he's, he's beside himself. Uh, was it uh, Festus, I think? Was it much learning hath made thee mad, you know, Paul? Uh, but, of course, these are, these are Judaizing teachers he's talking about here who, who were uh, making things difficult in Corinth and in other places for the Apostle Paul. He must be insane. Paul says, if we seem overly zealous... If you don't understand our behavior, our excitement, our zeal, then just let it be said, that's, that's, that's how we feel about our God. We'll do anything for Him. We'll do anything for our God. He says, on the other hand, he says, those of you who know us, you know we're of sound mind. You know we're not crazy. You know we're sober-minded. We are of sound mind. That takes us back to the first epistle to the Corinthians. In the very first chapter, when Paul says the preaching of the cross is what? Foolishness to them who don't believe. It's just a bunch of foolishness. But to us who are saved, it's the power of God. And so some were charging uh, Paul with being just foolish. He's like an insane man. Nothing real about him. But Paul says, those of you who know me know that I'm for real. You know why I do this. You know I am of a sound mind. So he says we are sober-minded, we are of sound mind, therefore they could rejoice in what Paul was doing. Now, in verse 14, in verse 14, he gives us the reason behind the way he conducts himself. He says, for the love of Christ constraineth us. That's what motivates us. Paul says, you know what what makes me do what I do, what keeps me going, what keeps me keeping on, the love of Christ constraineth us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we were all dead. Jesus died for each one of us. That's what he's saying. He says, I live a certain way because I have a continual understanding of that fundamental thought to Christianity. Jesus died for me, therefore, here's how I have to live. He said, I can't do anything else but preach the gospel. He said, I can't do anything else but tell lost ones what to do to be saved because ever in my mind is this wonderful thought, Jesus died for all. Jesus died for me. So the love of Christ constraineth us. The love of Christ motivates us. The love of Christ moves us to do what we do. And that He died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Now here again, Paul is addressing what? Those false accusers of his. Those that were guilty of hypocrisy, who really were not interested in souls being saved, but promoting themselves. So Paul says that, um, that these people live unto themselves. Okay? That's similar to the passages we read just a moment ago. They're just in this for themselves. Are there some who are involved in religious practices just to promote themselves? Sure. Paul says we're not of them, though. We don't engage in that. We are more interested in the Christ. We do what we do because we're motivated by Him, the one who died and rose again. Therefore, once more, he, um, he uh, endorses 
the idea that Jesus is not still in the tomb, he is alive, and that was the heart of his message. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Paul says, I don't judge according to the flesh. He said, I don't go out here making judgments based on fleshly appearance. I don't do that. He said, in fact, while we know Jesus came in the flesh, we don't even see him that way anymore, do we? You see, Jesus was here in the flesh for a period of time, but Paul says, I don't think about him being in the flesh any longer. Do we think that way? No, we've never seen Jesus in the flesh. What we visualize of Jesus is one what? High and lifted up and on his throne where he is. So Paul says, uh, uh, they judge, these enemies of mine, the ones who, who would, would uh, continually cause problems, according to the flesh we do not do that now Jews were very prominent in judging according to the flesh because they were the seed of whom Abraham it's all about the flesh whose children well we're the seed of Abraham remember on one occasion Jesus said uh, the Lord should change these stones over here that you see by the roadside into Abraham's children if that's what he's looking for children of Abraham that's not what he desires so he says we we uh uh, we're, not, uh, we're, we're not judging people after the flesh. Uh, then he says, verse 17, and this is a passage that all of us are fam we're familiar with it. It is indeed beautiful, and uh, we take great heart and joy when we read it. Therefore, he says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature or a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What is he talking about here? He's talking about the child of God, isn't he? He's talking about a Christian, the new birth. This is about the one who is now found where? In Christ. Now, isn't it interesting as you study the epistles of Paul over and over and over again, especially in Ephesians, for example, you find reference made to in Christ, all right? All spiritual blessings are where? In a certain place, right? In Christ. In Christ. We're baptized into Christ, okay? Can't be saved outside of Christ. You've got to be in Christ. Okay? Now, the, the New Testament Christian is going to ask religious friends and neighbors particularly that. Are you in Christ? How would you get into Christ? What blessings are there in Christ? Okay? Paul says you are a new creature in Christ. Now, I, I, I think about um, such great passages as Romans 6 where uh, we're baptized into his death, okay? And Romans 6 speaks about that new creation, just like Paul's talking about it here, this new creation in Christ. How many of you knew Ello Sanderson? Some of you knew him personally, didn't you? I, I met him several times. In fact, I was um, privileged to hear him in a gospel meeting when I was just a boy. And at that particular time, Harding College had uh, the chorus put together an album of all of his songs and I remember that I wanted that album. I was about 10 years old and I wanted that album and my dad gave me some money and an uncle of mine, great uncle of mine who was a song leader, loved Brother Sanderson, uh, he, he said, come on, I'm going to go over here with you and we'll get Brother Sanderson to sign the album. Brother Sanderson signed it. Years later when I was in Memphis School of Preaching, Brother Sanderson came and spoke in chapel. And uh, that was about 1990. His health had deteriorated to the point he couldn't make it up those stairs, so we met downstairs in the library. And I just had, I brought what few things were mine I brought with me from home, and I still had that album. He seemed to take great delight when I showed that to him. It had been probably 17, 18 years, um, you know, when he signed that. And just a few weeks later, and some of you will remember this, a few weeks later, Brother Sanderson passed away, and I said, I'm going to that funeral service of Brother Sanderson. It was held at the Wooddale building. I said, I'm going to that funeral service because as much as anything, I want to hear that good singing. And that's primary. If any of you attended his funeral service, it was primarily a song service, and fittingly so. But all those good hymns that Brother Sanderson wrote or uh, uh, maybe he composed them, arranged them, or what have you. But one of my favorites still is entitled A New Creature, A New Creature, Buried with Christ, Our Blessed Redeemer. And I remember that when I was baptized, uh, that was the song that was sung when I immediately came forth out of the water. That was typically what our song leader would lead, is that song 
a, a new creature. Now, the story behind that's rather interesting to me. Brother Sanderson asked a denominational preacher friend to look at Romans 6 and other passages, and he said, and this was all trying to convert the man. He says, I want you to take that, that chapter that deals with the new birth, that deals with being in Christ, that deals with being in He said, I want you to take that, and I want you to compose a song for me. That's how he approached the man. And so he never converted the man, but the man who penned those words, we have three verses of that song, and then that, that chorus, Dead to the World, uh, to Voices That Call Me, Living a New, uh, Obedient But Free, was written by a denominational friend who did not believe in baptism for the remission of sins. But the song is so beautiful. A new creature. Brother Sanderson tried to convert him by just asking him, why don't you compose the lyrics to, to a song based on Romans, the sixth chapter? Well, here in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, gospel preachers have used this passage for years, appealing to the minds of men. Be in Christ. Be a new creature. Old things are passed away. That is, the old way of living is passed away. Now, here's the first thing we need to remember when we, when we look at this verse that we cherish so much. Old things are passed away. Number one, that's your sins. All right, all those sins that were committed before you became a new creature in Christ, they're gone. Okay, they're gone. Now, as a new creature in Christ, you have access to the blood of Jesus, and every time you sin, you can depend upon what? The blood of Jesus keeping you clean. All right? You're a new creature in Jesus. Okay? So, old things are passed away. My sin is gone. Number two, an old way of living is now gone. Old way of living is now gone. I'm now a new creature or new creation in Jesus Christ. He set me free from my past. He's made me new. Now, that's just one way the Bible describes this new life in Christ. We are new creatures. We're not the same person anymore. We're a new creature in Jesus. One of the best illustrations I heard along this line, a man who was, was very abusive to his family, had serious problems with alcohol, he got drunk often, couldn't hold a steady job uh, because uh, what money he made instead of feeding his family it would go to alcohol. And finally, a, a friend, somebody who really cared, got a hold of him and said, you know, I want you to come to a, a gospel meeting, revival type service with me and hear the gospel preacher. You need some help. And the fellow couldn't argue with him over that. And so the man went with him to the service and he heard gospel preaching and it really got his attention. He could not take his mind off the message that he heard. He goes home that night. Anytime he was gone, his family was scared because they didn't know where he was. They thought he would be out drinking. He'd come home. He'll be abusive. When they'd hear him get out of the car or they'd hear him come up the steps, they trembled. He came in this night, though. He wasn't abusive toward them. He didn't say anything. He just went to bed. That happened the next night because, you see, they still didn't know. He went to the service again, heard some more gospel preaching. By the third night, he's ready to render obedience to the gospel. He still not told his family anything about this. But after he obeys the gospel, he comes to, to his home all excited. He busts through the front door, and the family doesn't know what to expect from him. He watched on that occasion as his little girl ran down the hallway and into her room closed the door. And it was like all of a sudden it finally, it finally hit that fellow what he'd what he, what he been doing. His abusive nature. His own children were scared of him. And so he walks down the hallway and he knocks on the door and no answer. So he just goes on in and he, he couldn't find his daughter anywhere. And then he heard some sniffling. He heard some crying. And it's coming from the closet. And he opens the closet door and there is his little daughter standing there looking up at him with tears in her eyes. And she's just shaking. She thinks her daddy is coming in there to hit her again, like he's done in the past. And tears started streaming down his face as well, and he got down on his knees and he looked at his daughter and he very gently took hold of her arms and he said, Honey, I want to tell you something. He said, I know you've been scared of me. I know I've been mean. 
He said, but I want to tell you some good news. Tonight, you got a new daddy. Right? Tonight, you got a new daddy. Did he know what he was talking about? He did. That's exactly what the Bible says. Now, on a more humorous note, I'll never forget a story I heard Brother Marshall Keeble tell. Marshall Keeble said that, that there was many souls who responded to the gospel invitation one night. And they're, of course, going down to Riverbank to baptize them. Not in some fancy baptistry down at the riverbank. And said, one lady's standing there in line, and all of a sudden she leaves. She leaves. And somebody said, where's she going? She's not going to be baptized. It'll be just a few minutes, you know, and we don't know what happened. A little bit later, this woman comes back in her white wedding gown. Seriously, white wedding gown. And the lady started saying to her, what, what are you doing? You're going to go down in that dirty water in that white wedding gown? She said, I married my first husband with this white wedding gown on, and now I'm about to marry one better than him, right? <laughs> right? Yes. I wouldn't call somebody like that crazy. She had an understanding, didn't she, of what she was about to do. And so what a wonderful verse here, verse 17 of 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if any man, man, woman, responsible boy, girl, be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. Now, do you remember last week ago Sunday, Brother Moser preaching, some of you were here, and Brother Moser preached a sermon, the Bible is God's Word. We, he said, I know that the Bible is the Word of God. And here's one reason, because men don't write like what you find in the Bible. Okay? Remember he said something like this. He said, he said, if all of a sudden no one knew anything about Islam, somebody would come up with it. For what reason? It was devised by men. If all of a sudden no one knew anything about some other religion, he mentioned, you know, it'd be, it, it would eventually evolve because it came from men. But no one would come up with the Bible. No one would come up with New Testament Christianity. Nobody would come up with this idea where the, the Savior, the hero of the story, is put on a cross, okay? No man would write in a way where man sees how wrong he is. You see, the Bible doesn't contradict itself. It contradicts man, doesn't it? That's why so many people despise it. So many people hate it. Okay, so here's what we know about salvation's wonderful plan. Verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away. All things become new. Men wouldn't conceive this, and here's why. It's verse 18, because all things are of God. What's he talking about? He's talking about those things that pertain to our salvation. Where did they originate? Not in the minds of men. It comes from God. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us, us apostles, the ministry of reconciliation. Who is the one who devised this plan? It was none other than God Himself. How did He do it? Through Jesus Christ. Now, with that thought in mind, very quickly, let's go over to the book of Ephesians right quick and see something that parallels wonderfully with that passage. Look at, verse, um, look at Ephesians 3, and notice Paul is talking about who he is as an apostle, beginning in verse 8. He says, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given. That is, that he should be an apostle. That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. There again is the humility of Paul. I don't deserve this wonderful privilege. Here's what I'm trying to do, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. He's talking about bringing Jew and Gentile together. All right? Then verse 10. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known, do angels, do those powers in heavenly places want to know about salvation's plan? Did they want to know? Yes, they desired to look into these things, Peter said. They want to know. Now they can know. How is it made known? It's made known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. How is God going to save sinful, lost man? He'll do it through Christ and through His church. That passage there is not saying the church makes known the wisdom of God. 
It is the wisdom of God, okay? To make the, you see the church of Christ. Oh, there's God's plan for saving man. Angels in heaven say, oh, that's how God's going to do it. That's what he had in mind all along. We didn't know that. He concealed that from us until now. But how long was it in the mind of God? Eternally, always, according to the eternal purpose. God didn't have to come up with some idea. I wonder how I can save lost man. Uh-uh. That's already figured out. God didn't have to figure things out. He already knew. So I remember when Wendell Winkler was preaching a sermon some years ago, he said, how long has the church been in existence? And Brother Winkler, and of course I'm thinking, you know, well, since what? Pentecost, right? Uh, you know, 2,000 years. Brother Winkler says, it's always been in existence. Now, wait a minute, Brother Winkler, what are you talking about? Hold on, he said. I understand that it was established 2,000 years ago. But he said it always existed where? In the mind of God. All right? So it always existed in the mind of God. So Paul says, All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now keep in mind that Paul's already talked of himself and the other apostles as being like what? Earthen vessels, right? They are the witnesses of the risen Christ. They are the earthen vessels. Uh, verse 20 of this chapter, they are his special ambassadors. They are the ones who are ministers of reconciliation. We're the ones who've made this known. To wit, he said, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. All down through the Old Testament. Remember, you don't think the genealogy means anything? Those, all those big long names that you read about in, in Matthew chapter 1. Why is all that there? Because it shows us how God kept his word and how the devil could never interrupt the seed line. That's why it's there. All through the Old Testament, God's working out his plan to do what? To bring Jesus Christ on the scene. Everything's pointing to him. So God was in Christ when Christ Jesus was born in Bethlehem. God was there in the midst of it. When Jesus Christ was engaged in his three-year ministry here on earth, as he lived that sinlessly perfect life, died, rose again, God's in the midst of all of that. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. When would there have been a time when God would not, uh, would not uh, um, impute their trespasses unto them? Those who were faithful under the law of Moses, they died in a right relationship with God, didn't they? Were they saved? Yes. Imputed unto them for righteousness, okay? They lived faithful under the Mosaic law, before that, there were those who lived faithful under patriarchy, as it all looks to whom? To Jesus Christ, who would one day ultimately pay the price. Did, did Noah go to heaven? Well, you know he did. Abraham? Yes. How did they go to heaven? By Christ, didn't they? They went to heaven by Christ, to wit that God was in Christ. So he says, God hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. We are like those who have gone on behalf of a king to a foreign country to make known his message. And so it is, though as, it is as though God did beseech you by us. Paul says when we speak, that's just like God speaking to you. He says we're being led by the Spirit of God. We're inspired men. So, so when we make an appeal, that's God making an appeal. All right? That's good news for the preacher, isn't it? Because you preach what's true, you preach what's right. Who's behind those words? God is. God is. And so... Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you, we beg of you, we're pleading with you in Christ's stead, just as if Jesus was standing here, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Now understand this, mark this down, don't misunderstand it. That text is not saying that Jesus was sinful. He knew no sin, right? For he hath made him to be sin for us. You could put this word in the text, and you're, you're making it clearer. He was the sin offering for us. That's what it's meant by that. He hath made him to be sin for us. There is a false doctrine out there that says Jesus became the biggest sinner on the cross. That's blasphemy. What he was, though, was the sin offering, the one who the text itself says knew no sin, that through him we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, when are we declared righteous? Back to verse 17, isn't it? Any man's in Christ, 
he's a new creation, he's been declared righteous before God. We can make a chapter. Wow. Thank you.